Ethnobotany simply means someone who's investigating plants used by primitive societies in various parts of the world. It's as simple as that. And ethnobotany has been around for many, many, many thousands of years. And uh, we are now uh, trying to salvage some of the knowledge that uh, primitive societies have amassed over uh, thousands of years and passed down uh, from father to son orally. And with every road that goes in, every airport, every missionary, every commercial person, even tourism, this is fast disappearing because when our, for example, medicines, when our own effective medicines are brought in and given to the Indians, they will forget sometimes in one generation what their forefathers discovered by experimentation. And we may be losing some wonderful shortcuts to find new medicines for humanity as a whole. Um, this is um, happening in all parts of the world where some people still are living in what we call primitive societies. Many of our common medicines were first discovered from plants, later synthesized to make them more available. But in the Amazon, for example, there are 80,000 species of plants. To give you some measure, measuring rod, New England has 1,900 only. 80,000 species. If chemists are going to try to get material of 80,000 species and analyze them and then give them to pharmacologists, this job will never be done, never be finished. What we should do is concentrate on those plants that people in these societies have found have some effect on the human body. We may never use the chemicals in them. We may use them for the same purpose in some cases. We may use them for completely different uh, reasons. For example, what took me first to South America was to study arrow poisons, which in 1941 were becoming very important in medicine. They are important today as the extracts are used as muscle relaxants before surgery. But here is a case. The Indian uses these poisoned arrows to kill. We're using them to help preserve life. Completely different uses. And another example is uh, rotenone. The natives fish with, uh, by throwing bark into still water in the Amazon and these plants have rotenone in them. Now, we don't want to poison our rivers any more than they are poisoned. Uh, we'd have no fish. But rotenone now is our best biodegradable insecticide, which can be spread over uh, thousands of acres uh, against insect damage. And in two or three days, they're broken down, and they don't carry through and poison plants and animals and eventually human beings. That's why I feel that some of my work may eventually pan out to be of help to humanity as a whole. I've just published a book in which, in my small area of the Amazon in the Republic of Colombia, 
we have 1,600 species of plants used as medicines or poisons by the natives. And I'm certain that in my 47 years of work there, uh, I must have missed a lot. But you can imagine 1,600 when the whole flora of my part of the United States, New England, has only 1,900. Uh, these people use at least 1,600. The immensity of the forests. I knew from books that the Amazon was rich in number of species, but I never expected to see such a tangle of different roots, vines, lianas, going up to the tops of hundred foot trees, and it is breathtaking. And when the first, it took me maybe six, six months or a year to get used to this, what shall I collect with all of these plants? Of course, you wanted to collect everything uh, the first time there. I had done some work in southern Mexico, but up in the highlands of Oaxaca in southern Mexico, which is a wonderful flora, but extremely limited in comparison with the wet lowland tropics of the Amazon, and uh, with many plants that we have up here, like oaks and pines. And I really didn't feel that much out of New England um, in Oaxaca when I could see a, a white pine. And, uh, but in the Amazon, everything was different. And uh, that's probably the first um, impression that I got. The second was, of course, to find these Indians so helpful, because I'd read some of these books about how treacherous they were and how dangerous it was for your life. Um, and uh, now I I don't believe in censorship, but I believe that some of our publishing houses should send manuscripts to people who have been in the Amazon uh, before they publish some of the books. I never had any problems with Indians. The Indian in the Colombian Amazon, and I suppose everywhere else, until he's civilized, is a wonderful person if he likes you, and I, I guess they like me, and I like them. If you act as a gentleman among these people, they are a gentleman. And I was with them all the time uh, that I worked there, because we have very few uh, European-type people going down into that part of the Amazon. Uh, it's not easy to get around because of rapids and waterfalls and lack of air service and so forth. I could work for three or four months with one uh, Indian or two Indians, and they'd go on trips with me um, far away from there big roundhouses, which are called malocas. And if one of these Indians says he will accompany you on a 10-day or two-week paddle upstream, you can be sure, if he's an uncivilized Indian, that he will do it and bring you back uh, if he knows that there's going to be a big tribal fiesta in a, few, in a few days or a week, and he says he won't go, the atom bomb wouldn't make him go. And, but one time they brought me back. I didn't know much about it. I 
had a heavy malarial fever, and I woke up in one of these big round houses in my hammock, which they had stretched up, and I was in it. And um, if they'd been some of our civilized, so-called civilized people, they would have left me in the forest and taken everything I had. Adios. I never felt... One time I had a boy who worked with me about six weeks, seven weeks. After the first week, he told me he'd killed a white man. And I knew the white man. And the white man had been bothering this boy's sister. There are no authorities down there, and they have to defend themselves that way. I kept right on working with this boy. And one of the best fellows I ever had. And uh, these are the experiences that I remember. The kindness, or if you want to use that term, of these people towards this intruder from outside. I would consider being a bank teller behind a glass cage every all day long would be far more difficult day after day after day than to be free in the jungle of the Amazon. Every day something new happened. Every day I might be able to find a species new to science, which I was able to do. And any botanist who goes in a flora as big as that can do this. And this is one reason why it's an invigorating job. It's not a difficult job. It becomes another job, but a job that you're really interested in doing and knowing about people, different kinds of people. And in a flora so rich in species that uh, the possibilities of, of uh, becoming bored don't exist. You have a feeling of achievement when you discover a new plant, even a plant that has no use. But if it has a, an interesting use, uh, it gives you a lift, let's put it that way. And uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a thank you for any work that you might have put into finding this plant. And I worked a lot with medicine men, or uh, they call them shaman, shamans. Uh, I like the word medicine men because it's easily understood by people. And I never found them reticent. I read in these books that are written by people who go down for a month or two uh, how you have to pry their secrets from them. I never found this. I was there and I saw what they were using. I could speak with them about their beliefs, especially their super sacred plants. I was very much interested ever since my undergraduate years here at Harvard when I wrote a paper on the peyote plant that's a hallucinogen, a cactus of the southwest and of Mexico. And so that interest carried through all my work. Among primitive peoples, I think in most parts of the world, certainly in the Amazon, there is no, no concept of organically caused sickness and death. It's all done by invisible arrows from malevolent spirits. And the hallucinogens are used in magical religious rites by primitive peoples. They're not abused as they are in our country and Europe by civilized people who have adopted them and used them without 
that religious background. The medicine men and sometimes the ordinary Indians, through these visions that most of them produce, think that they are con able to confer with the ancestors or with the spirit, malevolent spirits. And the medicine man thinks he can diagnose diseases which are caused by these people, malevolent spirits, and somehow, uh, either with plants or with mumbo jumbo, or both, or with certain rituals and dances, uh, effect cures. Now, the hallucinogens, my interest in hallucinogens is purely medicinal. I have never been able to understand the use of hallucinogens to get the religious experience. I don't believe we can get religion through chemical means. And in that way, we're different from the Indians who have thousands of years background using these in so-called magical religious rites. They have no concept, as I said, of organically caused sickness or death. And um, the Indian has to explain everything to himself. Why, thinking as an Indian, why do these few plants out of a half a million in the world have these unearthly uh, effects on the mind and sometimes on the body that they think can transport him to outer realms of uh, space. They have to explain this and they believe that in these plants there is a resident spirit. We know that this uh, resident spirit is a chemical substance. I've often told my students I have never been invited at the theological school at Harvard to a lecture. I'm a scientist. If I am, I can go and draw the formula of these spirits. And that is more than any theologian can do with his gods. But that's the reason why these plants are separated out from the ordinary plants that have dyes or foods or rubbers or other uses or no uses. And these are set on a pinnacle and they are not abused as they are by many people in our own uh, country and in Europe civilized people uh, because these plants are, are sacred to them. Low guns are used in the, most of the Amazon, especially in the western Amazon, with poisoned darts. And the natives hunt with them. And they make many different kinds of, of um, curare, arrow poisons, from many different plants. One plant is of very Im great importance in medicine. The others have different chemicals that some have been used and some haven't, have no use except as poisons. And they blow these little dots from these six or eight foot tubes that they make. And they're very accurate. They can shoot birds up at a, on the top of a hundred foot tree. And not only that, of course, some of the monkeys are very good eating. 
and they go along in bands. And if, <clears throat> if they used a shotgun and missed, all the monkeys would be a mile away. If they miss with a blowgun, it's silent. It would hit, if it, got, if it hit its mark, it doesn't kill immediately. It relaxes the muscles so much that the, the monkey loses his grip and falls down. Then they club him and he's dead. And the other monkeys say, what a damn fool, you, you can't hold on. And then they get a second monkey. If they use a, a noisy firearm, <laughs> the monkeys would be away. So from that point of view, it's wonderful. The thing that I found intriguing was how they run through the forest with these uh, eight, nine foot big things. Uh, and this blowgun business, one of my lectures in this course was on poisons. And I brought back a whole lot of blowguns there. They're in that case and we can't open it, but I do have one in my room. And the students, I did this the first time. At the end of my lecture, I said, now I had lectured about this Kurari business, and I want you to, to show you how the natives hunt. Well, of course, here, you, usually you do it that way, but here with the ceiling, you, it's awfully hard to hold this thing straight. And they have, they put a cardboard box with a circle in it, and I was able almost always to hit the red mark in the middle. Even though the thing, you know, being horizontal was, was not steady. Oh, and after that, everybody that comes here wants me to do that. It's become famous, that blowgun. I didn't go to school for a year. I had some, the old doctors, you know. I remember this old doctor. He, he said, it's stomach poisoning. I couldn't keep anything on my stomach. Now, my wife says I have a cast iron stomach and anybody who could live on the diet of the Amazon must, it must be okay now. But um, in that year, my father and my mother went to the library and, and brought books out for me um, and read to me. I could read a little bit, but they did most of the reading. One of the books was made by Wallace on the exploits, botanical exploits of Richard Spruce, the only other botanist who had been in my area of the Amazon. I love this book. I don't say that this had anything to do with my going to the Amazon, but um, I think it did when I began, went to school and got so that I could read, I always went to the public library and tried to get books on travel. And I think it did that, but I never, I can't say that Richard Spruce, who is my great hero now, and I go to England almost every year to, um, and have gone up to his little house where he, after 14 years in South America, he went home and lived 22 years writing up his notes in the little hamlet in Northern Eng England in Yorkshire. And I've been able to raise money to put a plaque on his little house at, on the estate of Castle Howard. And uh, I'm on a committee now to uh, uh, celebrate his 100th uh, anniversary of death in 1892. Um, wonderful man. But I, I do think that the, my father and mother reading from that, and I looking at the pictures in it, that he drew. 
he didn't have a camera, you know, in those years, 1850. Uh, I think it, it interested me in reading travel books. But I don't say that that, I never knew that I'd be going into Richard Spruce's country until I actually went into it. I'd always had an interest in collecting plants. I'm a Bostonian, but a part of my family is, was up in the country. And in those years, Townsend, Massachusetts was a little town. And one of my cousins, uh, uncles had a, a farm. We spent the summer up there. I got up at five in the morning to milk and uh, go out haying and so forth. And I made collections of plants. I never thought I could learn, earn a living collecting plants. When I came to Harvard, I took the course in this room, which I ended up teaching. And I became interested in economic botany, the uses of plants. And I got so interested in this, I went to the professor. In those years, we had six in the, collect, in the, in the uh, course. My largest class was 28 anyway, but we had only had six. And we had a, right in the back there on those tables, a practical laboratory for each week. And the week we studied narcotics, we couldn't have naturally a practical exam. Uh, uh, laboratory. And the professor had put out in the bookshelf over there six books. He said, instead of a laboratory this week, I want you to read one of these books. I must have been very busy, so I flew over and I picked out the smallest book. <laughs> that book changed my life. It was written by us physiological psychologist, Heinrich Kluver, on the peyote cactus. I got so excited about this, this beautifully written book, that I went to Professor Ames and I said, do you think I could un write my undergraduate thesis? We have to have for a, honors an undergraduate thesis here on peyote. I had made a report on that book. I'd said, I, this is what I want to go into. I was a pre-med student, but um, this put me in touch with medicinal plants, hallucinogens, but medicinal as well. And so he said, yes, but he said, no student of mine writes a literary thesis. You've got to go out and see this plant used. So I went way out west, a Bostonian who'd never been west of the Hudson River uh, until I was a junior. I went way out west to Oklahoma. I must have thought I was going to drop off the edge of the earth. And I studied the native Kiowa and Comanche Indians in their all-night ceremony I went out with a, a graduate student of anthropology from Yale. You see how broad-minded we are at Harvard. A Harvard and a Yale man together. <coughs> and we um, went through a couple of those all-night ceremonies, took the peyote, and I got, I brought, I got peyote back and did some botanical and chemical work, and that was my undergraduate thesis. Then, of course, I went to Mexico and did work on my, on the medicinal plants of the Mazatec Indians for my doctoral thesis. And I fell so much in love with Mexico, Oaxaca, in the south of Mexico, that I thought my life would be devoted to that flora. But 
with this opportunity to go for one year to the Amazon on a grant to study a medicinal, the medicinal, the, the curare plants and their composition for, because curare or extracts from it were becoming important in medicine as muscle relaxants. I took that up when I got my doctor's degree and uh, I thought I'd be going for a year. Then of course, when the war broke out and they put me on rubber, that kept me in there and I was able to do both works, rubber and medicinal plants. Well, I was an undergraduate at Harvard and I became interested in medicinal botany. And was trained for that in botany and chemistry. Uh, and when I got my PhD, one of the job offers that I had was a grant to go to, from the National Research Council, to go to the Amazon to study plant uses, especially uh, the arrow poisons, uh, and so I took that and went down there. <clears throat> and when that was in 1941, when Pearl Harbor happened, uh, I finally got back to Bogota and went to the em embassy. I was 28 or so, and wanted to find my status, they said, you're not going back you're to the States, you're going right down into the Amazon and try to get the Indians to tap wild rubber. The Japanese had taken over all of Southeast Asia, we, where our plantations of rubber were established by the British and Dutch. We had no more rubber, which was essential for especially the heavy uh, military planes. And the United States government and local governments of the Amazon countries were sending men in to try to resuscitate the extraction of rubber from wild trees. The main rubber tree which the British took to Malaysia uh, was the basis of all plantations. There are nine other plants in that same group. And the Indians, once the plantations had started to supply the world with uh, better and cheaper rubber than that with, that the Indians had been producing with terrible, almost slave conditions uh, before the plantations, um, we, we had to, the Indians had, had three or four generations that <clears throat> when they hadn't tapped wild rubber. So <clears throat> we were sent in to the various countries to try to stimulate this for the war effort. And uh, I had been in the Amazon of Colombia, so I went right back among my Indians, and uh, I worked during the war on that. Some I always found, tried to find, an Indian who would speak Spanish. And uh, my Spanish, of course, was probably poorer than the Indians at that time. Um, and as I got farther and farther inland, this was much more difficult. And I was able to get uh, along in two of the 14 languages. You learn a little, I probably murder them, but <laughs> when the, the old folks won't laugh, but the, when the kids go into hysterics, I know I've done something wrong. <coughs> but 
if you learn one or, the, or two of the languages of big groups of Indians, many of them are small groups dying out or very limited number of people, you can almost always find an Indian who could speak this other language. It's like going to Europe with English. You can almost always find somebody, if you get in trouble, who could speak English. If you're in Yugoslavia, how many Americans speak whatever language they speak? But it's sort of like that. And um, they, as I say, the, the kids, you learn a lot from by listening to the kids when they laugh, when you um, say something wrong. I collected many plants that had no uses because I was in a new region. The only other botanist who'd ever been in my area was Richard Spruce 140 years ago, a British botanist who was there four years and did wonderful work. And so, even though a plant had no known use, I would collect it if, and I usually, because I couldn't amass great in a canoe. All my work was in an 18-foot aluminum canoe, and I couldn't carry too much. So in each river, I would collect a plant once. Unless I felt it might be a new species to science, then I'd collect more. And we're paddling up the overhanging branches, and I'm collecting. I may collect 30 or 40 different plants in a morning, <clears throat> the Indians paddling. And in most cases, they would say nothing if I took a plant and put it in the press. Every now and again, one of the, usually the older men, would say, what do you want that plant for? Now this tipped me off that they had a use for it. But you don't go right out and say, what do you use it for? So I invented many diseases. They must think my race is more decrepit than it is. Uh, and I said, this plant may be a medicinal plant for my people. We don't have it where I live. They may say nothing. The next day, I would collect it again in another locality. They may say nothing. The third day, I would collect it again. Then the curiosity. Uh, one of the older men would say, that's no good for that sickness in your, among your people. I said, how do you know that? Uh, that's because we use it when we have a poisoned stomach from eating uh, fish that's gone bad. You, you people, if I had said, this might cure a, a sprain in, in my knee or my elbow, They'd say, well, that won't do any good. That, then they get to arguing. The, the younger boy in, that's paddling and the older man that's guiding the canoe, they might have differences of opinion. Then the older man would say, don't believe him. He's so young, he doesn't really know. And then, of course, you check in another river with other Indians to see if they have that same use, a different use, or no use. This is very slow work because you have to check. Not that these people are putting me on and lying about it, but there is a scientific reason. If a plant is used over a wide area by people who've had no contact with each other for the same or a similar purpose. That is a plant that should be investigated chemically because they have come up with the same or similar uses. A good example of this, there is a hallucinogenic snuff 
made from the resin that is in the bark of a certain tree in the Amazon and all over Latin America, in the Orinoco and in British and Dutch Guiana, all the wet tropical forests have this tree. I was very interested in this because it was a new, well, new to us, hallucinogen, very potent snuff. And I was able to identify this. It had been written up a number of times in anthropological papers with the Indian name, but no identification. We knew nothing about it. Um, I was able to get material of it. Now, this resin has two other uses. One, in certain tribes, it's put on arrows as an arrow poison. I've seen it work. We, don't, we know what it is that causes it to be hallucinogenic. We still don't know what it is that kills an animal. It's not a fast uh, death like the curare arrow poison, which is another plant. The third use is as an antifungal medicine. We have very little in our own pharmacopoeia for athlete's foot or for jock itch. We have suppressants, but if it gets into the living part of the skin underneath the dead part, which is outside, you have it for life. And all you can do is suppress it when it comes out, when the conditions are right. So this is very important, I thought, very important. Um, the natives in a number of tribes go out in the morning, strip some of the bark from this tree, take that red resin and paint um, on fungus infections of the skin, which are very common in the wet tropics, ringworm and all those things. They go out, they let it dry. The next morning, they go out and do the same thing for 10 or 15 days. And I have seen the redness disappear. Now, this could be a suppression, or it could be a cure. They think it's a cure. But even if it's a suppression, we should know what it is that does that. Now, I gathered a number of pieces of bark and sent them to two different, on two different occasions, to two drug firms. I had to dry them under the sun because if I'd packaged them up in the month or two in the mails, they would have been rotten. They were fresh and wet, you know. They found nothing in it, fungicidal or active against fungi. Later, one of my students who was working in Dutch Guiana, Suriname, among Indians, found two tribes using the same plant for the same purpose. And the Dutch Guiana was 800 air miles from my area. And these people had, had absolutely no contact, couldn't have had. Furthermore, reading back in an old French um, report on the plants of French Guiana, this was 1775, the same use was reported. Okay, <clears throat> with all of that, I assumed that my drying of these pieces of bark had changed the chemistry, ultraviolet light, the heat of the sun, or something. Recently, a very interesting 
thing happened. A very good Brazilian chemist working in Manaus, which is a city in the middle of the Amazon, who could go out in his automobile and get fresh bark and get right back to the laboratory, found three chemical substances, two of which he thinks are responsible for the um, fungicidal activity. Now this is um, one of the experiences, if you can call it that, a long drawn out experience, but you see, I'll probably never live long enough to see some of these things develop into new medicines. I, uh, I saved, I had one month's vacation a year. I stayed down for two years and then came home and to Boston in the winter to skate and ski and get fat again in two months and do a lot of my identifications of the plants I had brought back. Then go, went right back. I rarely got in the early days up to Bogota, the capital city, where I kept a room in a British boarding house. It's a very cold city, 9,500 feet. And uh, the British boarding house is wonderful. They have a fireplace every night, and uh, you, you enjoy that up in Bogota. The Colombian people rarely use a fireplace, but the British always had a coal fireplace. And I, wouldn't, I didn't go up because it took at least 12 or 13 days to get up to Bogota from where I was, first by canoe, then by horseback, and then by bus, and uh, it's just not worth it. So I'd say in for six to uh, one time 13 months in the field, and naturally living on native food, which is very good. It's monotonous, but very good. I never took microscopes. I had a little hand lens to see the interior of flowers, but um, you can't do that kind of work in, in the field. Um, maybe you could do it up here in this climate and where you can use automobiles and so forth, but I, the only equipment I took in were, were um, cameras, uh, just two cameras, a Leica and a Rolleiflex. No, unfortunately, no uh, film camera because, well, first, we didn't have room in an 18-foot canoe, and second, they're so, so delicate. If something went wrong, I'd have the damn thing and carry it around and it was useless. And no radio, naturally. I never felt the need of a radio. I remember I was there during the war in Korea. When I came out to Bogota, I heard about the war in Korea. The papers were full of it. Another six months, I came out talking peace in Korea. Another four months or six months coming out, part peace talks in, in Korea. So what, what's the sense of every year, every day, being a slave to the newspaper? I mean, I wasn't, I didn't know what was happening and it didn't, there's nothing I could do about it anyway. And so I never worried about not being up with the news. Before penicillin was available, I developed septicemia, blood poisoning, in this arm. Fortunately, I was near enough to walk to a place where they had a Colombian military flight. And I was able to get out, and my arm was all swollen and red. I knew what it was. 
but uh, we got to the army base at Villa Vicencio, a little town at the base of the mountains. And I was going to catch a bus and go up to Bogota and see a doctor. Though the road had been destroyed by landslides, it was the wet season. You couldn't get out of Villa Vicencio. So I uh, went to a doctor in Villa Vicencio and he gave me a shot of something and I passed out. I don't know what it was. And there was only one American and his wife in that town, a man by the name of Dr. Marston Bates, who was a working on the Rockefeller experiment that eventually led to the inoculation against yellow fever. And the doctor called him. And I, lo I woke up in Marston's house. He made a, a thing with electric bulbs, sort of a tunnel, and put my arm in this, and the doctor was, he was able to get uh, uh, the sulfur drugs. And they saved my life and my arm. That was the only time I was really worried when, when I found I couldn't get to Bogota with this arm in that condition. But nothing else except for that one septicemia, which in the early days I had was before penicillin was available. Um, the only thing I've really had was malaria a number of times. Um, there is no preventative of malaria, except one type which has recently, only recently, a vaccine has been developed by a Colombian doctor for one type only. Um, there are suppressants. These tourists that are told to take one pill a week of Aralen are suppressing if they get one or two mosquitoes, there's enough threshold, we call it, in the blood to take care of the infection. If you're working there, the, the Rockefeller Tropical Doctors told me when I first went in, do not dose yourself up with these uh, suppressives. If you're bitten by 50, infected mosquitoes, which if you're in that region, you may have that many. There isn't enough in that low threshold to kill all of the organisms. Once you've had malaria, you know two or three days before you were going to have the fevers from the symptoms. And then you take double the dose and knock that out. And so, aside from the normal uh, care, being in an Indian house after dark, when the mosquitoes are mostly out, although in the, day, in the daytime, some of them will be flying in the forest, but we always wear long sleeves, never shorts. Uh, long sleeves, long trousers. It's part of the work. It's part of the whole situation. Even some of their medicines. For example, conjunctivitis, which is very common in the wet tropics. It's contagious. Uh, they have a number of plants that they use to hasten the disappearance of the... Uh, problem of, that affects the eye, a bacterial infection. And I had it once, and uh, I used one of their plants. It happened to be a new plant of the family of the pumpkin, which they cultivate for that purpose. Now, whether it was a natural cure 
and would have just disappeared without a treatment, or the treatment that they use, a tea of the leaves of that plant. Uh, I, I don't know, but uh, the condition disappeared. This is one of the difficulties of working uh, so far away from laboratories, you see. That's one difficulty, and another difficulty is that when you have to dry leaves or bark to send them out to the States or Europe to a well-supplied laboratory for analysis, you may have changed the chemistry. I had made a tremendous collection of plants, and the airplane that was going to take me out uh, took me in. After a while, in the early days, I had to go in overland and over by canoe and so forth. Later, uh, I could fly in with hydroplanes. Uh, the, I would make an agreement with the pilot that on such a day, let's say two months, three months later, weather permitting, he'd be there and I had to put out a bed sheet so he could see that I was there before he landed. Well, the day was coming. So uh, when it, the day came, there was no plane and it was a beautiful day. But I thought, well, he's, they had always come on the day they thought, but I said, well, maybe he's had some more urgent thing to do. So I waited and waited and waited. I couldn't go more than a quarter of a mile either way from that house in the forest because you don't hear these planes with the canopy of the top trees early enough to run back and put out that sheet. <laughs> so um, I often say that that half mile, a quarter mile each way area around that house is the most thoroughly studied botanical area in the world. There isn't a moss that escaped my, my eye. And it was always going to be the next day. Now, if I had known what had happened, well, first, I began to think there's a revolution in Bogota, or the plane had fallen. They only had one or two of these hydroplanes. And if I had known that it was going to be that long, I could have gone with Indians down the river through 22 rapids to the Brazilian frontier where there's a small Colombian military post which had a radio and, and a weekly service, airplane service. But it was always going to be the next day. And so, after a while, after 62 days, two months, uh, they came. I began to say to the Indians, I'd hear this buzzing, and I'd say to the Indians, there it is, it's coming. No, doctor, abispas, um, wasps, swarming around their houses, making this buzz. Um, and so I began to, th I didn't know what had happened. When they finally came and I got all my specimens on that plane in Bogota, um, they told me what had happened. They had, they were Catalinas. It's an old type of very heavy, slow plane, a cargo plane. And the only place that these could be serviced and their motors changed at certain hours was Toronto. 
And so they had sent both planes to Toronto, and it took almost all that time. And when they came back, of course, they had many other urgent things to do. Well, Schultes is there, he's happy, so um, we'll, we'll go eventually. That's a, an extremely sacred point in the Rio Pira Parana. That is a hard granite rock, and nobody knows what Indians did that probably a thousand years ago. How they did it without modern instruments, chipping that away. Some of the um, engravings are an inch deep. This is one of their gods, one of their spirits. We don't use the word god. They don't have that idea. It's a spirit. This is the spirit of water or of the river. Ni'i, it's called in their language. And all the Indians of that area consider that the place where the first Indians came. It happens to be almost on the equator. And it tells that the people who did it knew a little about the astronomy, the sun and the moon and all these things to pick the center of the earth. These people today believe it's the center of the earth. And it is the place where the first Indians came from the Milky Way. They came down in a dugout canoe drawn by an anaconda snake, which to them is sacred, a man and a woman, and three plants, the tapioca plant, which they eat, the coca, a source of cocaine, which they chew, and ayahuasca, which is a hallucinogenic vine. And they landed there. And that's a very sacred place to the Indians. And I want you to look at that uh, picture that I have of it. Uh, wonderful uh, story. And they told me that story. I mean, I once met, met an American missionary woman who said, these people have no religion. I said, I differ with you. I don't like to see missionaries meddling with other people's religions. Leave them with their own religion. They have no religion. I said, my Indians, and I told them the story. Well, she said, you don't believe that. I said, I didn't say I believed it. It's, um, um, I said, do you believe Genesis? Oh, she said, yes, that's the word of God. I said, is there anything more stupid, utterly stupid, than the story of a snake running after a woman with an apple in its mouth? Why, she said, that is uh, symbolic. I said, so is the other thing symbolic. She wouldn't speak to me the rest of the day. I got this from an anthropologist, a Colombian anthropologist, who was recently there. This happened very recently, and I haven't been there for years. Um, one of these missionaries went down and apparently sprayed this pagan god with brown, uh, gray paint, which hardened in the sun. And that on the top, he wrote something about, uh, in red letters, Our Lady of such and such. Apparently, this anthropologist told me the natives went into a revolution. Probably, he said, in the next 25 or 30 years, there won't be any missionary who dares to go in that region and I can't blame the Indians. When missionaries, whatever their special brand of 
Christianity is um, come in, they change the whole social structure and beliefs of these Indians. In my opinion, what they have to give the Indian uh, isn't a gift. He can't understand our religion. Uh, and he's lost confidence in his religion. In uh, another thing that when missionaries get into an area, other white people or civilized people follow them and alcohol comes in and all of the bad things of our um, civilization follow. That's not the missionaries that do that. They, are, they mean well, but with them follow our civilizations. The other thing is that um, these, these people um, usually don't wear clothes. The men wear breech cloths and the women. Uh, when a missionary comes in, he says, you've got to wear clothes. It's immoral to run around this way. They don't need clothes. The Indian who never has clothes on has a beautiful skin. He's two or three days in the river cleaning himself. The missionaries bring in or commercial people following them sell them clothing. They can't often get soap. They use plants that have saponines in them that foam. And, uh, but they wear these clothes until they're so dirty that they get skin problems. And uh, I've often argued with certain missionaries, uh, they're not immoral. What is more immoral than our own race? And look at the clothes we wear. Of course, there's no answer to that. But I suppose they pass me off as an infidel, which doesn't bother me at all. The missionaries bring in clothing and tools, which are good, and things of that sort, but they have to buy them. And then they have to start working to earn a little money. This means that their agriculture, their fishing and hunting suffers. They don't have as much time as they used to have. And the whole structure is different. I would say the whole structure falls apart. The structure that they know. Uh, I'm sure the missionaries and other people wouldn't agree with me. But I don't think we are giving them another uh, social or religious structure that they can understand or live with. Uh, part of it's based on the importation of things that they don't have and, and they learned to need them. And um, if um, they certainly can't understand our religion, our own people can't understand some of the things in the Bible. When um, I read in the Bible as a little boy that Jesus said to a man who was dying practically, take up thy bed and walk. Nobody told me that they slept on little mats. I thought, Jesus must have been a terrible man. I thought of a brass bed. Asking this man that was dying to take up a brass bed and walk? Well, can you imagine? These Indians, they don't know what snow is, ice, when that is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, just a couple of things like that. Leave them alone. 
That's my opinion. I've got a lot of material which students for many years hence will be studying the dried specimens with all their localities and uses, native names and scientific names and students can be studying these. Secondly, I'm publishing now slowly my field notebooks. When I came home teaching a full load, which I like teaching, uh, for 27 years and being director for 20 years with that, um, all that um, administrative uh, work, I had very little time myself to write up. Now I'm doing nothing but writing up uh, my notes slowly. It take a long while. And um, I feel that out of my work on rubber, but more especially on medicinal plants, there may eventually come some help for the rest of humanity. Some people say, oh, this is just exploiting the native. That's not true. I'm not stealing anything from the native. And if a new medicine comes out from one of these plants, it's possible that the natives themselves will have that medicine when it's once synthesized on a cheaper basis and available through missionaries or um, commercial people or other things. Look at quinine, which was discovered by the Jesuits in Lima, who had been told by the, the viceroy's wife was dying with malaria. And the Indians came in and said, we use this quinine tree up in the highlands. So he tried anything, and it worked. And look how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of poor people, let's say India alone, who could get cheap quinine eventually when they made plantations. And so we're not exploiting the poor of the world, the uh, because once the medicines are available cheaper and more easily, the poorer people can get them. Or the people, the primitive, so-called primitive peoples, from whom we learn th these things. And this, all this nonsense about us going in and stealing the things from these natives and forgetting them. I never felt that way.